Okay. Everyone, you're welcome. We are delighted to have you here. And uh, the mission of TechSoup and all of us here is that the overall goal of our organization is achieved. And it's through this mission that TechSoup and other partners have made available a lot of resources for organizations like you, you yours nonprofit to benefit from it. So not to take much of our time, we're going to get started today. Today is the information session. So Eli, our presenter, is going to take us through the, the processes, what a TechSoup is all about, what the Google Grant is also all about. So at the end of this meeting, you will be able to apply for the Google Grants. And if there are issues, we'll also guide you through it. And we'll also show you, we'll be able to understand how to create converting advertisement that will go on Google that will bring in results. Through these uh, Google Grants, a lot of organizations have been able to increase their budget uh, in fundraising and also uh, in creating awareness and reaching out to more clients and funders across the globe. So it's something that we all should take advantage of. So without much ado, I think Ella, you can take over from here. Sure. I'd love to jump in. So hi there. I'm Eli. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm a community manager with TechSoup. I actually got involved with this TechSoup Connect community and network 13 years ago when I was new to Vancouver and was looking for a place to find other geeks who cared about things. And I got very excited when I found that meetup, got involved, and eventually after a couple of years, TechSoup asked me to come and support the other network leaders across the globe. And there's currently chapters now in, I think, 35 other countries. So today I want to just give a quick overview of what is TechSoup? How does it work? Some of you may already be members, in which case I appreciate your patience. But for many people coming in here that may not be yet be a member of TechSoup, and so I want to give that bit of an introduction. From there, we'll pass it over to the chapter host and leader, Hilanen, who actually is an expert in using Google Ad Grants and can actually go deeper into how the program works and some of its support functionality. And so we'll take it from there. So let me start by giving that overview of Next year. Here we go. So it's true. Social good does need good technology. And it's part of why we offer these free events where we can help connect nonprofits with the skills and knowledge they need to actually succeed in their mission because we're not technology organizations, we're mission delivery organizations. Yeah. So I'm Eli and I'm one of the TechSoup Connect community managers. And what is TechSoup, you ask? TechSoup is a nonprofit like yourself with a global footprint. And so what we do is we connect two players together. One of the things we do is we have built relationships with the major technology companies, Google, Microsoft, Adobe, Cisco, Slack, Zoom. And what we do is we create this hardware discount and software discount and donation program where we make it really easy for you to get access to the technology you need. The other thing we do is we have partnered with organizations around the world to deliver that discount program to nonprofits in their own country. Because, you know, TechSoup's based out of San Francisco and they have no relationships and don't really understand the needs of what a nonprofit in Sierra Leone, in Nigeria, in the UK, in Singapore needs. And so what we do is we partner with existing organizations who have those connections. And so what we've done around that is, is connect in West Africa region with WAXI, the West Africa Civil Society Institute. They have currently offices in Ghana and they're opening one up in Nigeria. I see some people have come from other countries like the U.S., in the U.S., there is TechSoup USA, who delivers the TechSoup program in that country as well. I'm based in Canada. There is a TechSoup Canada, who manages the program as a separate organization partnered with TechSoup Global. What can you find in that catalog? As I said, a lot of the major players are there. 
Zoom, the tool we're in right now, things like Bitdefender for security, something like Tableau for your data visualization needs. Maybe you need to store your documents. Box is a great solution there. Or maybe you need something that your desktop suite, your software, Microsoft is going to offer to start 10 free licenses to every dog profit pretty much in every country. Also, there are things like Google, which we'll talk about today, which is available in many countries. But sadly, that Google for nonprofit program is not currently available in Sierra Leone. However, I see that many of you are coming from Nigeria and the U.S. today. In those two countries, the program is available and more details will come about that program specifically in a moment. As I said, TechSoup is this global network. We've actually at this point served over a million nonprofits, saved the sector over actually at this point, about $16 billion in licensed, like in market value of hardware and software. And we do that in 236 countries and territories, basically everywhere in the world. And so you're saying, okay, that's great. But how does this work? What's this all about? What is this technology marketplace? And so here's what it looked like when I first started at a nonprofit. I was sitting as a volunteer manager and I wanted to do some design work. And so I happened to have a college friend who worked at Adobe. So I called up my friend and said, hey, could you throw me like a used older version of the software? Just put it in the mail, send it over to me. And he had something lying around so he could do that. But I didn't have any connections to any of the hundred other technology companies. I didn't know anyone at Microsoft or Dell or Cisco. Zoom didn't exist, of course, at the time. And so it was really hard for you as a nonprofit to get access to donated and discounted software. Basically, if you didn't know someone or happen to be lucky enough to be based in like the Silicon Valley in California, you weren't going to get access to that software. And they're gone. And the organizations had a bit of a problem. These companies had a, pro a problem, which is to say they were interested in di giving out their software, but they had lawyers in the inside who said, how do we know that this organization is a legal, valid organization? How do we know if we've given to them already this year? How do we know if they fit our criteria? Maybe we only want to donate to organizations with a budget of under $10 million or only to youth organizations. And this was just a big data problem, which prevented all this philanthropy from happening. So TechSoup stepped into the situation and said, we can solve this. We can make this easy for both parties. And the way this happened is TechSoup has become this global central validation engine. So when a nonprofit comes to TechSoup.org or TechSoup.global and creates their free account, what they're essentially doing is uploading a couple documents, your last budget, your proof of incorporation from the government, and you do this once. And once you've filled out this form and given us a couple pieces of information, we store this and we can use that exact same information with any of the other companies in our catalog. So it's the dream. What if instead of having to write a separate grant application for every organization or foundation you applied to, you instead wrote one application and got to use the exact same application to get instant approvals from any other foundation. That's what we do at TechSoup. You create your account and then you get instant approval for any discounts or offerings from any of our partners because they all are using the same shared information. So that's the power of TechSoup. And that's how we serve 1 million organizations and save the sector $16 billion in fees. So that's a really powerful, interesting story. But of course, the next thing is, once you have the hardware and software, what do you do with it? That's where events like this come in, where we get to connect you with local experts who can share best practices on how to use that technology. So if you want to get involved with TechSoup, the first thing to do, of course, is to create your account. And so what you do is you go to TechSoup.global and then select your country, whether that's going to be Nigeria, Cameroon, Singapore, the UK. And from there, it will direct you to the right instance of TechSoup for your country. And if you're a nonprofit, charity, church, or library, 
you're likely eligible depending on the criteria. And it's a little bit different in every country. But let's be honest, it's going to take you 10 minutes. The registration is free. So if you do it and actually in the end find you aren't eligible, well, you didn't waste that much time. And so it's worth testing anyways. The thing that's most important is that you have a copy, a scan, or some kind of documentation that you received from the relevant government uh, showing your status as a registered organization in your country. So once you've done this, then you put in the information, what is your focus area? How big is your budget? Because each one of our donor partners has slightly different eligibility criteria. So you may not be eligible for everything in the catalog, depending on the size or focus of your organization. And you should start the process now because it usually will take about two weeks for you to get approved. But once you've done that, then you can move into the TechSoup catalog and start making requests. And actually, when we average across the whole experience of organizations using TechSoup, they're typically saving about $17,000 in hardware and software. Obviously, not the case for smaller organizations, but that's the average across our global experience. There is, of course, all kinds of other great free resources at TechSoup.org. There's blogs, webinars, articles, and even if you are doing good in your community, but not a valid nonprofit or charity, you can, of course, still always access those resources at TechSoup.org. And you can also go to great events like this one, and you'll find it as you found this particular event at events.techsoup.org. So come get involved, love to connect you with your local chapter. So that is my quick overview of TechSoup. What it actually looks like is this. So you would go to TechSoup.global and you would say, all right, what's my country? And so this particular event is for the Sierra Leone chapter, although I think just more of you from Nigeria. So let's do Nigeria. So you go here, search for Nigeria, click go. And from there, it will forward you to the version of the site for Nigeria. So you'll see here on the front page, it's got some of the major pieces of software in our catalog, everything from a 50% discount for Zoom to other pieces of software. And so you can either browse the catalog, but you can also see along the top that there's this catalog, which brings you in here. You can sort search by the donor company. So maybe you need something from Amazon Web Services because you're doing some hosting. Maybe you need Asana because you're doing some project management. Maybe you're needing Slack. You can find all of these here in the dropdown by company as well. But the main thing people often want to know is, am I eligible? And the way to find that is to go into the help menu and you'll see there is an eligibility criteria section. So if you pop into here, it will then tell you for each country, this will be a little bit different because it's all in different legal territories, but it tells you who is eligible. And so here it will tell you what organizations are eligible for the program. So take a look at that. And if you meet those criteria, then your next step is to go here to the right and click sign up. And so you'll want to create that account. And so you'll start by creating your personal account and then you'll move on to creating your organizational part of the account. And this is actually especially important for the Google for Nonprofit program. Because what happens is once you create your account, we generate a special ID just for your organization. And you'll need that. So if you go to say the Google for Nonprofit program, so you're not on the TechSoup website, but if you begin your eligibility process by getting started, by the third step or so, it's going to say, prove you're a nonprofit. And the way you prove your nonprofit is it tells you to go to your TechSoup account and copy over this big random character link and copy and paste that into the Google for nonprofit application. And that's how Google knows that you exist already in the TechSoup catalog to instantly give you that approval. If you haven't done that yet, you'll need to then wait two weeks to get that code generated once your approval as an organization is set. So there are several things on the internet 
like the Google for Nonprofits program, like the Microsoft donation program, where they're actually getting their proof that you're a nonprofit from TechSoup, but it's all actually happening on the company's website. So that's just a thing you'll need to do, which is if you want to get involved with this Google for Nonprofit and Google Ad Grant program, you'll want to start first by creating your TechSoup account because you'll need that to complete applicate the application and eligibility. So that is what I've got so far. I see there's two things showing up in the chat. Let me just take a look at the questions. Anything here? Ah, you've got something here. Looks like in German. And unfortunately, I can't help you with that. Despite my Vandergeesen last name, which is Dutch, I don't know any German, unfortunately. So that is, is my quick overview of TechSoup eligibility and the application process. With that, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'm going to pass it over to your host, Hilden, who can talk a little bit more about the Google for Nonprofit program. And yeah, and Sharon, that, yeah, I will go and put the link to these slides into the chat for you right now. Thank you very much, Eli, for the presentation. So for the Google for Nonprofit program, similar to what TechSoup is about, it's also meant to support the work of uh, nonprofits. And so every month, Google gives out $10 worth of uh, adverts uh, revenue where nonprofit can advertise their products and services, their courses online. And this goes a long way. Uh, for example, we use this on organization as well. And when you have your presentation, you, your, sorry, your ad, you can target it to whichever country that you are reaching out to. And when you do this, people who visit your, or who uses Google to search for services in those areas are able to find you is, for example, if you're working in the mental health sector. For us, we work in oral health. So we have, a, we have ads that are in oral health. Uh, if you go on Google and you search for something that's related to oral health, uh, we are likely to pop up on the Google page. And so that goes a long way in expanding our voice as well as bringing in more users to our website, visit our website, which in turn will compare them to donors. It could also be a donation page on your website. You have a donation page and you want people to know more about it. You can equally create your ads that leads to those pages. So when people go online, it connects to it. And aside from that grant, Google also gives you other services like uh, Google map. Yeah. Uh, if you're working in the, in the geo sector, you want to link your services to Google map. Uh, you can be able to do that because you are with the, uh, this comes along with the Google for nonprofit service. And in addition, you also get access to Google space, which includes, uh, email services, drive, and a whole lot of other services that are very useful for your organization. And yeah, that's... absolutely. I think like the Google workspace is very valuable, especially for organizations that don't yet have like their own organizational email. So if you are an organization that's still using maybe a Hotmail or Gmail address for your organization, you're not going to look like you're a very like established professional organization, which will be make it more difficult with your marketing and fundraising. But if you own your own domain name, you can create like a hundred plus email addresses for your staff and volunteers on your own domain name using Google for a nonprofit and workspace. So it's a really valuable resource. Yes. It makes you look more, more serious and people take you more serious as well. And uh, yes, there's also Google YouTube. This is a package for YouTube, which is also available for nonprofits. So amongst this, these are the things you start to gain when you register and you are approved on TechSoup. You have the services on TechSoup and you come to Google and also have the additional services here that will amplify your courses and your mission in the community. I've got a question coming in from Gina in the chat around Google Voice. And Gina says, I have Google Workspace, but they're still charging for voice. Is that included? 
Um, and the answer is, I don't know the answer to that question. So if anyone else knows the answer, please throw that into the chat. That would be really helpful. I'm not sure about that particular question. I'm not sure too. So I'll have to confirm. And when I do that, probably I could leave a message. Yeah. I'm looking through here, through the site right now. And it looks like, yeah, I don't see anything about voice in the plan. So that may be something that's not currently included in the, in the Google workspace donation. Sorry, I didn't mean to distract you though. Please continue, Helen. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Will you, will, can you walk us through the, the ads? I'm afraid I don't think I can. I don't have an, an active account right now. So I don't think I can actually get into the back end to show ads. And I know you've got suddenly a bit of a challenge around going in to sh actually show people what's happening right now. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So unfortunately, I, yeah, I don't think I can take us too deep into there. Yes. Yeah. How about a video presentation? Yeah. Is there a good video that you would recommend we can play right now? Actually, I might have something. One moment. Sure. Let me see. Google AdGrants. There we go. I have something here that I think will meet the our needs since you're not able to give a live demo today. So let me see what I have. Great. This looks like this will work to the job right here. I'll just fire that up. Just let the ads go past. Yeah. So what we'll do then, it sounds like it's after this, we're going to play a bit of a recording of an earlier demo that was actually done for TechSoup Canada, but the core information should remain the same for any country, whether that's the US, Nigeria, or Sierra Leone. And so I'll, I'll have to do a reshare in just a moment to include audio. And so I'll be right back in a second. There we go. Working our way through ad, dude. Here we go. And finally, but not only one, but once you cannot be one of the following types of offense. So you cannot be a government entity or organization. You cannot be a hospital and you cannot be a, a school, a childcare center, an academic institution, or a university. There we go. Is that coming through? Just to clarify this a little bit, you yes. can be the philanthropic arms of these institutions. So you can be like a education foundation. You could also be a hospital foundation. And also just to clarify the hospital medical one, you can be a medical related charity, like an autism awareness charity, but they're more looking at the actual treatment centers itself. So that's why they stipulated hospitals as not being eligible for the grant. So as long as you hit those three main criteria, you can be pretty confident that you will get the grant. So that's just the preliminary piece about eligibility. We're gonna explain what the grant is and I'm gonna loop in Lily, who's gonna talk about this now. Great, thank you, Simon. So what is the Google Grant? The Google Grant is a program that gives eligible nonprofits $10,000 per month in free Google Ads. That's not $10,000 per year or $10,000 one time. It's $10,000 per month in free Google advertising. So how is this possible, you might ask? Google Ads will give Google Ads grantees credits every month worth $10,000. These credits renew every month and they have no end date. If you ever spend the maximum amount in one month, so $10,000, your ads will just stop running. You're never ever charged by Google for running any ads if you're part of the grant program. Again, it's $10,000 per month in free Google Ads or $120,000 per year in free Google advertising. So I'm just gonna pull up a poll right now to see if you guys know how much is the Google Grants worth. If you wanna participate in the poll, you can put your answer into the chat. Great, so looks like most everyone's voted and the results. Most of you got it. So it's correct, $10,000 per month. That's how much you'll get with the Google grant. I'm going to turn it over to Simon now to describe what pay-per-click advertising is. All right, thanks, Louie. And we always ask this question because sometimes the 10,000 sounds like so much that people think it's per year or, per, or one time. And it's really important to un understand it's per month because that's a 
large part of the value of the program that they do give you an, a, such an immense amount to, to work with. So now we want to give you some background in what's called pay per click advertising. You need to understand this to understand how the grant actually works. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, not this, <laughs> where am I? Here we go. Here is a sample search results page. And so in the example, I run a search for donate used clothing. And what you on the page in the screenshot is the search results. And I'm going to break this down a little bit for you. At the top of the page, as a section that's usually reserved for paid ads, or what is traditionally called pay-per-click ads. And the reason why it's called pay-per-click is because usually anytime someone clicks on your ad, you would have to pay Google a certain amount per click. But of course, if you are a nonprofit, that cost is deducted from the credits that you have. And so you're not actually paying anything for that click, but that's just usually how it works. And I'm going to distinguish that from the section below, which is usually reserved for organic listings. Now, organic listings is what Google is naturally choosing to display to users when they search for something. And the big difference is that if someone clicks on your website or your listing there, you don't have to pay Google anything. That's just free for everyone. Of course, in order for you to appear high in those organic listings, that's a whole other area of marketing called search engine optimization or SEO for short. And so that's actually quite a complicated area. It's, I would say it's a cousin to what we're talking about today for paid ads. And so we're not going to delve into that, but we're going to focus on the paid ad section. And it's really important to note that the paid ads proceed or are listed on top of the organic listing. So there's good value in being placed in that section of the search results page. So let's talk a bit about how that works. So let's say you're an advertiser and you run a used clothing donation program. So what you would do is first come up with a list of keywords that you think people are going to use to search for you in Google. So for example, you might be thinking of keywords like donate used clothing or donate used goods or donation boxes. And what happens is if someone's search matches a keyword that's on your list, your ad has a chance to appear at the top of the search results. And if someone decides to click on your ad, they get taken to a page, a website page, or a landing page that you specify, and that ideally speaks to what the ad was talking about. So for this used clothing donation program, you would want to send them to a page that talks about your program and gives people options in terms of how they would actually make the donation. So that's just generally how it works. Now, the number one question I get asked when I explain PPC ads is, do people actually click on them? And I must admit, when I first learned about this, I didn't think I really clicked on those ads. Uh, I thought I'd just ignore them, but we want to reassure you that the data overwhelmingly supports that people do click on them. So what we have here is a statistic, 300 million plus clicks per day on these ads. And of those 300 million plus clicks, they could be your supporters, they could be your donors, or they could be your customers. And so the idea of the grant is to use some of that $10,000 per month to bring those three, some of those 300 million clicks per day to your website where you can engage them and turn them into your supporters or your donors or your customers. So that's just the very kind of like high level theoretical explanation of how it works. And we want to get a little bit more practical with you and get into kind of the nitty gritty of it. So Lily's going to take us through some problems that Google Grants can solve, as well as share some uh, case studies of successful ways that nonprofits can use the grant to achieve meaningful impact. Great. Thank you, Simon. So as Simon mentioned, we'll be going through some problems that Google Grants can solve. So what problems could $10,000 per month in free advertising solve for your nonprofit? Oftentimes, I hear from nonprofits that they need to increase awareness of their organization. If you have the Google grant, you can use the grant to promote your organization to people who are looking for your brand, your cause, or your content online. So for example, if you are a mental health organization that talks about depression or anxiety, someone who is looking for tips to battle depression or anxiety online on Google can find your organization if you create an ad surrounding this. If your problem is improving event attendance, you can use the Google ad to create ads that promote your events to people who are looking for things to do. For example, if you have an event happening in Toronto, you can create an ad on Google that will speak to this event and direct people to the page that talks about it. If your nonprofit has a product or service that you sell, similarly, you can use a grants program to promote this product or service to people who are looking to buy something similar online. So for example, if you sell t-shirts or jewelry that go to your nonprofit's cause, you can create an, an ad around this and people can find it and then find your webpage that sells these services or products. If you need to get more donations, which I'm sure many of you are looking for, you're in luck because you can use the Google grant to create ads that direct people to your site who are looking to make donations online. An example could be donate to X cause. You'd create an ad around this and someone who's looking to donate to that cause to support it can find that ad online and then be directed to your website where they can make a donation online. 
Finally, if you wanna grow an email list, you can similarly use the Google Ads to help you do this. Of course, growing an email list requires a little bit more of a strategy, but oftentimes you can promote joining a newsletter along with a certain resource that this person would find useful. We'll be talking a little bit more about this in our case study. Before I continue, I'll put out another poll and ask you, how could the Google Grants help you? What problem could it solve? Okay, and it looks like almost everyone has voted. I'll close the poll. So it looks like the majority have voted for increasing awareness, followed by improving event attendance. I've seen many nonprofits successfully use the grant to solve these issues for the organization. So I'll jump next into our case studies. So in our first example, we have the Redwood Women's Shelter. They had an issue of awareness. They had services for abused women. However, many of these women didn't know that their organization existed or knew about the help that they provided. The Redwood Women's Shelter was able to obtain the grant. When they had the grant, they then looked to their website. They found a page on their website that had relevant information for these women. So in the example we see here, it had the number for their 24-hour crisis hotline, as well as information about the services they provided. Next, they went to something called the Google Keyword Planner. This keyword planner helps you find the search volume for certain keywords. Essentially, how many times is a keyword or search term getting searched on Google every month? They typed in keywords that were very relevant to that page. So in this example, they typed in keywords like women's shelter and shelter for women. Then they chose the keywords that had the highest monthly search volume. In this example, women's shelter has over 8,000 searches per month. That means that Women's Shelter is getting searched on Google over 8,000 times per month. Then with these keywords, they created a free Google ad. When someone typed in the keyword Women's Shelter on Google, their ad appeared near the top of the page, which we see here. Then the searcher could click on their ad and they would land on the designated web page where they would find information about the crisis hotline as well as how they could help. In this instance, the Redwood Women's Shelter was able to use the Google Grants to improve their awareness by bidding on keywords such as Women's Shelter and Shelter for Women. The result was that the Redwood Women's Shelter saw a 630% increase in crisis calls per month while they were running the Google Ads. In our next example, we have the San Francisco Playhouse had a problem. They needed to sell more of their show tickets, so they were able to obtain the Google Grant. Next, they looked to their website and they found a page that had relevant information to the issue they wanted to solve. So in this case, they had a page about upcoming plays and how someone could buy tickets. We can see the buy ticket button here. Then they went to Google's keyword planner and they typed in keywords highly related to that page. So we can see here, there are keywords such as Broadway musicals, stage shows, and Playhouse Theater. They chose the keywords that had the highest search volume per month. In the instance of Broadway musicals, it has over 18,000 searches per month on Google. Next, they created a free ad with the Google Grant program that would appear when someone typed in one of their chosen keywords. In this instance, it's Playhouse Theater and their ad appears near the top of the page. When the searcher clicked on their ad, they would then arrive on their designated webpage, which had information about how to buy tickets. In this instance, SF Playhouse was able to solve their issue of selling more tickets by using the Google Grant to drive traffic to their website using keywords such as Broadway musicals. The result was that the SF Playhouse saw $4,600 in ticket sales per month directly from using free Google ads. In our final client case study, we have the case of Save the Redwoods, an environmental organization. Save the Redwoods had a problem. They wanted to build up their email list. So first, they chose a page on their website. In this instance, they chose a page that offered a free family guide to anyone who signed up for their newsletter. This is a great strategy if you want to build your email list because you're offering people a relevant piece of information that they would want in exchange for signing up to the newsletter. We can see here, you had, have the offer to get your free guide when you sign up. Next, they went to the keyword planner and typed in relevant keywords such as redwood trees. These keywords have a high search volume. Redwood trees has over 14,000 per month. Then with the free Google ads, they created an ad that showed up at the top of the page when someone typed in one of their keywords. Once someone clicked on their ad, they would land on the designated web page that had information about a free family guide when someone signed up for the newsletter. This is a great strategy, again, to get people to sign up. So in the case of Save the Redwoods, they were able to use the Google grant to build up their email list by using keywords such as redwood trees that had high search volume per month and that were very relevant to that page and to what people were looking for. 
the result was that Save the Redwoods saw 400 extra emails per month directly from using free Google Ads, which is incredible. So a handy framework for understanding how to use the Google Grants in the context of your nonprofit is one, determine the problem or challenge that your nonprofit has and that you want to solve. So that could be increasing event attendance, getting donations, or growing your email list. Next, choose a landing page or build a web page that solves that issue. As we could see in the last three examples, all of these nonprofits chose web pages that were very specific to the problem they wanted to solve. Next, go to Google's Keyword Planner. Find keywords that are very relevant to that page and that have a high search volume. Finally, bring those people who are searching for that on Google to your website using Google's free ads. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Simon to explain how you can get your Google grant. All right. So hopefully at this point, you're excited to get the grant. You want to learn more about how to get it. And I'm going to explain how to do it. I'm going to run one more poll for you before we do so. Last poll of the day. Very simple. Do you have the Google grant? And it's just a simple yes or no. And so we're going to give you about 20 seconds to just put your answer in. I always find this question very interesting because it's neat to see what your peers are doing, who has the grant, who doesn't, who doesn't have it, and who's just learning about it. I always find this quite fascinating. So I'm going to close the poll in just a moment and then share the results with you. And actually, this is a higher number than I'm used to seeing. You usually see about 10% say yes and 90% say no. So we have 21% yes and 79% no. So a lot more of you who have the grant. So that is really neat. Now, this next section is not gonna apply, of course, to people who have the grant. So just sit tight. We're going to the more practical portion of this in just a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna break it down step-by-step. Step. The first thing you need to do is to get your TechSoup token. Just to explain that a little bit, if you recall in the beginning, in order to go through the process, you need to be first reg registered with TechSoup as a nonprofit. And so once you do that, you grab what's called your token. Uh, uh, basically, the token enables you to apply for the next stage of the grant process, which is called Google for Nonprofits. Now, Google for Nonprofits, the pre-qualification, there's a bit of material apply for the parent program, Google for Nonprofits. And again, you use your TechSoup token to do that. Okay, once you are approved, you need to create a Google ad account. So Google ads is the platform. It's the name of the platform that Google uses to manage the keywords and the ads that you would run. So you need to create an account first. And then you use that to submit a pre-qualification survey. So you create this account, you submit it to this pre-qualification. There's a, a bit of material that you need to go through, like a, a small video. There's a small survey you need to go through to, to get this. So it's pretty straightforward. Once you are pre-qualified, then you're going to set up your Google ad account. And that's what we're going to spend some more time on at the end of this webinar, just to talk about how you would go about doing that. So you set, you set up the Google ad account and there's some very specific instructions that Google has for you. And I'll send you those instructions in just a little bit. But once you set up your Google ad account and it's done according to the rules of the program, then you're going to what's called enroll in the Google ad grants program. So what that means is you're going to take your account that you set up, you're going to submit it to Google and they're going to review it to make sure that you set it up correctly. And if it's all done correctly, you basically get the grant at that point and you get to start using the $10,000 per month. So on this page, I've listed a couple of the URLs, google.com slash nonprofits in terms of where you find those items. And just to explain to you also in terms of timeline, if everything is quite straightforward, you could probably get through the whole process within 14 days, 14 working days, let's say. But there's cases where you may run into certain complications. Perhaps your organization applied five years ago and, and you have no idea who did it and what email they did it under and all these things. So those can create some complications that would lengthen the process a little bit. Again, everything's smooth within 14 days. I just want to send you a quick link here in the chat box. And this is a link to the official Google guide in terms of how to set up your account. So it'll take you through these six steps, more or less. And if you follow that carefully, you should be okay. It can also be complicated. So I'm gonna cover some of that in the next piece and just show you, I'm gonna explain and then also show you different components of what you should be doing. Okay, we're talking about how to create your first Google Ads campaign. I'm gonna go through a step-by-step -step process. All right, so the first thing you need to do is to really strategize. 
This is important because the strategy is a foundation behind everything else that you're going to do with the Google Ads account. So what do we mean by strategy? If you remember, Lily was talking about the framework for how to use the Google Ad Grant. So it's a bit of that. First of all, understanding the ways that you want to use the grant and what benefit you want to get out of it. Okay. Now, once you have that done, you can move on to step two, which is to structure what's called campaigns inside Google Ads. And the reason why the strategy is important is because it essentially informs what campaigns you're going to build. For example, we asked a question, in what ways do you want to use the grant? And it was something like 43% of you said awareness. And so you need to consider what you want to make people aware of. And what that means is that's going to become one campaign that you're going to run. But let's say that you also wanted to promote an event. Like you have an event coming up that you want to promote. That would be a second campaign that you, you would run. And we also get this question all the time you are not limited to just one campaign at a time. You can run multiple campaigns simultaneously. You can run five campaigns, six campaigns, and you can change them all the time as, as often as you want. So that's just how the campaign structure works. Now, I'm going to hop into the browser for a second. I'm going to pull up a empty Google ad account right here. And I'm going to show you how you create a campaign. It's just... It's going to be bare, but I'm just going to create a new campaign. So once you log into Google Ads, this is what it looks like. And if you have nothing in there, you'll see this plus sign. So plus new campaign. I'm just going to click on that. I'm going to create a new campaign. You can pretty much ignore all these template guides. You can say do it without any guidance. And it's important in this stage to select search. That's just one of the rules of the program. Again, if you go to the guide, they detail all of this very carefully. And... All you have to do is follow it consciously, conscientiously, and then you'll be okay. So make sure it's a search campaign. You can ignore this bottom part and just hit continue. And so what you can do is give the campaign a name. And so for today's example, I'm just going to say use donation, use, use goods donation. So let's say our objective is to get more used goods like clothing, furniture, et cetera. I'm just going to make a campaign just for that. Now, again, some other rules. You cannot use search partners and you cannot use the display network. These are just like if you use them and you apply for the grant, guaranteed you will be rejected for it. So you must unselect these. <clears throat> okay. Now, next piece, you go down, you scroll down, there's locations. What you can do with the Google Ads is really finely target where your ads appear. You can do it at the city by city level. You can do it by postcode, zip code. You can do it, you can pick a point on a map and take a certain radius around it. So there's a lot of control that you have in terms of where your ads show. And so I would just recommend picking whatever is relevant for you. If you have a program that only runs in Toronto, of course, it doesn't make sense to, to promote it in BC or something like that. So. Whatever is within reason is what I would suggest that you enter here. Languages, you could probably skip. It's usually just English. Okay, so budget. This is where it gets not too tricky, but I just want to explain. What you want to do is create one that's 329. So just to explain a little bit, it's a $10,000 per month grant. Google Ads in reality works on a day-to-day -day basis, on a daily basis. So 329 is just simply 10000 roughly divided by 30 days, and that's how you get 329. So you're just going to want to make sure you set your budget to 329 or less when you first apply. Last, I'm not going to go too much into this because it's very easy to go down a rabbit hole. And in the time that we have, we won't be able to. For now, just say clicks. In the guide, they will explain the requirement of using what's called conversions. Now, I'll talk a little bit about conversions in just a little bit you're going to want to use a conversion-based bidding method. For now, just say clicks. And maximum CPC, again, not to go too much into it, but all you have to do is just say two. That's just one of the rules of the program, that you can only bid a maximum of two CPC. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to hit save and continue. And we've created a campaign. And there's nothing in it. Right now, it's just a container for other pieces of work that we're going to do. And I'm just going to walk you through what those other components are going to be. Okay. So I'm going to go back into PowerPoint. 
And let's go to the next step. So we've created our first campaign. It's empty. It's just a container. And the next thing you need to do is to research keywords. So keywords is probably where you're going to spend the bulk of your time. You need to find the ways that people are searching for what you offer. And there's a couple of general principles that, that we would want to impart to you. So first is to look for keywords that are relevant and that also have high search traffic. You ideally want both of those components. So imagine that you wanted to do this program about donating used clothing and you find this keyword, buy chocolate, and it has like 20,000 people search for a month, some huge amount, but it's not relevant to you. Then it's not really a keyword that you should be using because if someone sees an ad about that and they click to your site, they're not going to find what they're looking for. They won't be very happy and they're just going to leave. So that has no purpose for you. On the flip side, imagine you have the perfectly relevant keyword, like the exact keyword that you want. But Hello, Eli. We can't hear anymore. Eli, are you there? I think it's other main issues with the network. You may want to use the negative keyword movie because perhaps a lot of people are searching for movie theater shows. And if you offer live theater or like Broadway theater, you may think that this is not the audience that you want. So if you create a negative keyword for movie, then you can filter out the wrong audience and then by extension, leave the right audience for you to promote to. So that's just generally what negative keywords are about. Okay. I'm going to hop into the browser again for a second and just show you. Lily has showed you the keyword planner already. She introduced you to this, this tool, right? And so if you're in a Google ad account, you get there by clicking on tools and settings, and then you go to the keyword planner and it's free to use as long as you have a Google ad account. So it's a quite a useful tool to use. Once you open it, you get this choice. So I like to do find new keywords. And this is where you're going to enter in some ideas that you have. So maybe it's donate use clothing. And what you want to do is to run the search and find out how many people are searching for the keyword every month. So I see donate use clothing has 140 monthly searches, but this iteration closed donations gets 4,400 big difference. And so that's part of the keyword research process. It's like looking through it and then trying to discover what iterations are more popular with how people search. And sometimes it's not what you expect. So that's why you need to do a lot of research on this. Okay. So I'm just going to hop back into the campaign that we're building together. I put together a list of just prepared keywords, just a couple of them. So once you go through that process, you're going to enter in the keywords that you want to use, and then you can save and continue. And I'm just putting it into something called an ad group, which is another container. And I'll explain what that is in just a moment. Okay. Now I'm going to hop back into the presentation and explain ad groups. Okay. So like I said, an ad group is a container. And in fact, it's a sub container that lives inside a campaign. And this ad group container is made up of a series of keywords as well as ad text. And it's important to know that all the keywords within one ad group all share the same ad text. I'll illustrate to you what I mean by this, but I want to give you, first of all, a tip. So the tip is don't put all your keywords into one ad group. Pretty much what I just did in the, in the example, I put all, the, all three keywords into one ad group. And why you don't want to do this is because you want to make your ad groups as contain only keywords that are relevant to each other, highly relevant to each other. So rule of thumb is try to keep it to about one to 10 keywords per ad group. If you start going beyond that, it's likely that the keywords are not that relevant to each other. Okay. So I'm going to illustrate with an example here. Same example as what I just built. So we have one ad group and we have three keywords, donation box, donate furniture, and what to do with used clothing. And as I was just explaining, within an ad group, all the keywords share the same ad text. And what that means is if I write one version of ad text, all the keywords are going to display this ad whenever someone searches for it. So in the example, I said, find local donation boxes, use our free locator tool, et cetera. All right. That is a great ad for the first keyword, donation box. 
but it's less relevant to donate furniture. If I wanted to donate furniture and I saw the ad, it might invoke some questions. I might be thinking, can this donation box fit my couch? So I might not be sure about that. And so what you can do is split up your keywords into separate specific ad groups. So same example, I'm going to move them into independent ad groups. And what happens is you can then write ad text that is specific to each ad group and specific to each keyword. Once again, I have ad text that's relevant to the donation box keyword, but now I can write something different for donate furniture. So I can say, donate your used furniture, schedule a free pickup. And this wording has more value to me if I'm looking to donate furniture, because I'm everything. I don't want to drive my couch down there, but you can give me a free pickup. That's amazing. So this is how you can capture your audience better. And again, because I've split out what to do with used clothing, I can then take some more creative liberties here and say, are you running out of closet space? Doesn't make sense for furniture or donation box necessarily, but it's perfectly relevant to someone looking to donate used clothing. And so this is why it's important to break out your keywords into separate ad groups. Okay. Now step five is to write effective ad text. And ad text, as you saw in the example, is basically what is shown to someone in the search results when your ad appears to them. And so the best advice I give you is to write at least two variations. And this is a rule that the program has. You need to have at least two versions of it. But ideally, I would recommend three variations of ad text per ad group. And so in the example that I showed you when we broke out the, the keywords in different ad groups, I just showed one version of the ad text, but you would want to write two other variations of that. And the principle is very simple. You never really know the best way to capture your audience. You need to experiment with it and play around with different versions of your messaging and then let the data speak for itself. And the data will tell you, oh, many more people are engaging with this version compared to another one. So you have to go through this process of testing. Okay, step six is to either pick if you have one or build a landing page. For today's purpose, I'm just going to define a landing page as a page designed to engage and convert your traffic into whatever action it is you want them to fulfill, right? If you are promoting an event, for example, you should not be pointing that person to the homepage, right? You have to send them to an event page that talks about the event, that has details, it tells you the date, the cost, and gives them an easy way to register for the event, right? And so this is really important in terms of extracting as much value as you can from the grant program, right? You don't want to waste those dollars. And you don't want to just, you, you don't want to get just clicks. You want to get meaningful action for your nonprofit that grows your nonprofit, right? Okay, last step and probably very underrated, you have to monitor your results and you have to optimize based on the insights that you're seeing from within the account. One very practical reason why you need to do this is that there are certain program standards. You need to maintain a list of highly relevant keywords. You can't have any keywords that are of poor quality score. And these are just some examples of standards that they put into place. So you have to have some sort of regularity in terms of looking inside and eliminating those items that are not in compliance or don't maintain the standards. But more than that, you want to identify the things that are making it successful and then build upon that. And so a tool that's going to help you immensely with this is called Google Analytics. In case you're not familiar with analytics, it's a free platform from Google. You have to install it on your website and it tells you some information about what people do when they get there. So things like how many people get to your website, what pages are they visiting, what device are they using? So lots of really fantastic information that you gather. And one thing even more powerful that you can get from that platform is something called conversion tracking. So I mentioned this earlier, conversion will just simply define as someone completing an action that has value to you, meaningful value to you, right? So it could be a completed donation. It could be a registration, it could be a purchase, right? And we define these actions as conversions. And what you can do with analytics is track anytime someone completes a conversion, and then you can trace it back to the work that you're doing in the Google ad program. So what that means is at a keyword level or even a search query level, what is leading to people donating or registering or buying something? And that's really powerful information for you to have. So 
those are the basically the seven steps on how you would go about creating your campaign. And if you follow through from top to bottom, that is definitely where you want to start. So that's pretty much it from us. We're just going to say one quick thing about what we do. If I'm just going to simply put, if you don't know how to do it, don't want to do it, don't have time to do it, this is something that we can help you with. And that's all I'm going to say about what we do. We're going to leave the last 13 minutes for questions. And so I'll hand it back to TechSoup and see what questions you might have for us. Hello, we've been rounding up the questions and we really do have a lot of questions for our Connect Ed team. So I'm going to try and put this into a thematic order and we're really sorry if we don't manage to get to your question. First of all, thanks for the presentation. It was great. We've had questions flooding in. I'll just start with the questions about applying for the grant. Can you discuss a little bit more about the Google approval process? Some people have been having trouble with being approved for ads. I don't know if you have experience with that, but maybe if you could speak to any like barriers that might be in place. Is it referring to the writing ads and they're not getting approved or is it maybe like some part of the process that they're having issues with like getting the Google ad account approved or something like that? I think they are having trouble with getting the Google grant approved. Google grant approved. Okay. Yeah. So actually in, in recent times, Google has made it a little bit harder. I, or should I say they've increased their standards. And I think that's probably why people are noticing this happen more. I'll give you a couple pieces of advice on how to make sure that you get the grant. Number one. I would really highly reference and highly recommend that guide that I linked, the one from Google. It has a very detailed step-by-step -step process on how to go about it. The, the issue is if you deviate from it even just a little bit, like if you do one setting incorrect, it could be grounds to get it rejected. By the way, if you're rejected, you can also reapply. So I would just say go through it very carefully. Now, the second thing that I've been noticing recently has more to do with the website than the actual application because Google does assess the quality of your website before they approve your grant. So a couple of things I would recommend. Number one, make sure that your site is HTTPS. If it's an HTTP site, it may not pass their standards. By the way, for you to upgrade to HTTPS is something you would want to do anyways because just for the natural results, this is becoming a more important factor in terms of like how you rank. So you're going to want to secure your site regardless. And this is becoming, this will be the standard very soon. So secure site. And the second thing I can tell you about websites is to just include in the footer at the bottom of the page, just a little note that you are a registered charity and also listing your charitable ID number. They do sometimes look for that. So that's the best advice I can give you in general terms. Great. Thank you for answering that. We've also been getting a lot of questions about eligibility. So actually, I think TechSoup can speak to that a little bit. If you're concerned about your eligibility, you can reach out to the customer service team, or you can just take your token and try uh, through the application, and they'll let you know if you're eligible. So I'm just going to move on to a, another question in the similar like thread, if an organization applied a few years ago and they were accepted, would they still be able to access and use the grant? You can take that one. You definitely would still be able to access the grant. If you were approved for it, you have it. What you would need to be aware of is there's an email that's associated with that grant account. And if you lost that email, you'll really have to reach out to Google support to try to help you because grants can't be transferred. You'll have to log in with that email, get back into that Google ads account. So this really varies at what point you, you had the grant, perhaps if you had been approved for Google for nonprofits and you're in the process of getting the grant, but you lost the email. It can be a bit tricky and it varies case by case, but really be in contact with Google support about that, but you would still have the grant. Yeah. And just to add to that, if it was years ago, it's most likely has been suspended because it probably hasn't been used. So if you get back into it, you're going to have to submit to Google to reactivate it. 
it's actually a fairly simple process to do that. But just be aware of that. If you don't remember the email, you submit a new application and then there's like this process to regain access to a new email, but you have to wait 14 days for that. So go to the Google for nonprofits application process to get regain that as well if you don't remember the email. Okay, great. And I see a lot of questions about the TechSoup validation token. So just speaking from TechSoup side, if you just log into your TechSoup account and you're on the My Account page, there is a tab that says TechSoup validation token. And if it's expired, you can generate a new one. Let us know the customer service team at TechSoup Canada if you have any trouble with the validation token side. Another question a nonprofit has, they've managed to get the Google ad grants, I believe, but it says that none of their ads are running because they need to add billing information. Do they still need to add billing information even after receiving a grant? If you still need to sub submit billing information, it indicates that it's not a Google ad grant account. Under no circumstances should you ever put your billing information in there. If you do that, automatically that account cannot be activated for a grant. It's just some kind of technical issue that they have. So my guess is there may be a small lag, perhaps in terms of activating your grant. If you're still seeing that message and you definitely got approved for it, it's somewhat, it's possible, but less likely that maybe you have logged into the wrong account. Like maybe it's approved in a different Google ad account. Now, if it's, persist like this, then I would encourage you to contact the Google support line and they could help you out with that. But yeah, if it says billing, it's not a Google ad account yet. Okay, perfect. That's great to know. Let's move on to some questions that are more about the Google ads itself. Does Google ads affect the organic listings at all? So organic and paid are supposed to be independent of each other. One does not really affect the other. So they say. <laughs> That's perfect. That's very succinct. So we had some questions about geotargeting, and you mentioned that you can select certain regions. Should keyword search terms include any localized terms or locations? I think that's a good strategy. If you, there's a couple ways to do it, especially if let's say you have a campaign that might get traffic from, let's say it's an event or like a festival that sometimes attracts people from outside a city or something. So you can do it two ways. You can do one campaign that is has a uh, specific city or geographic targeting, like a small one, and just use very general keywords. And you could also have another keyword that's for people outside of town, like outside of the city, but include keywords that have the geographic information in the keyword itself. Or you can do some kind of mixture of that. But it's, it is nice practice to actually have keywords that include the ge ge geography in it. Great, that's good. great to know. About the ad topics, can you change them from month to month or do you have to stick to one topic? Yep, so you can, you can change your ads whenever you'd like. As we mentioned in the presentation, there's no limit to how many campaigns you make, how many ad groups you make, how many different types of ads you make. So it's really up to you. I would recommend if you want to change it drastically, perhaps create a new campaign if the theme is completely different. So if you have a campaign about an event that's upcoming and then you think, hey, we want to make a campaign about donating, make a brand new campaign for it, make brand new ad texts. If it's slight variations on that ad text, so for example, if you have an event, a re recurring event and the dates change, sure, why not change the dates that's in that ad text? You can change it whenever you'd like. Okay, so I'm hearing that there is like evaluation involved in your in testing your ads. Do you have any best practices you want to share about the amount of time you should be monitoring an ad when it's running before maybe making a change to it? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. It's a, it really depends, but we like to give the ads a little bit of time to, to run so that when you make decisions on it, that it's statist statistically significant, right? Now, it also depends a bit on how much traffic your ads are getting. Like maybe they're getting, you know, 10 clicks a day or something like something a little smaller Then perhaps you would want to give it some more time to gather an accrued data so you can make a decision on that. Maybe it gets a thousand clicks, right? And then maybe you don't need as much time. <clears throat> so I would say 
in general, if you're looking for just a rule of thumb, I would say at least once a month. Now, with ad text, there are certain smart bidding and smart targeting options where Google's machine learning algorithm will figure out which ad is best to run and they will show that ad more often anyways. And so that's why we encourage people to run three ads because when you have three variations or more, then the algorithm can perform better. So as long as you do that, it should to some degree automatically optimize itself. Great. So I do want to give a heads up. We're coming up to 1 p.m. Are we okay to carry on maybe for five minutes or so? Okay, perfect. Because we still have quite a few questions. You mentioned click-through rates. There were some changes, I believe, to Google Ads last year. And some people were getting suspended because their click-through rate was not high enough. Can you talk briefly about that and maybe how automated Google Ads versus fully managed might change that? Yeah. Okay. Click through rate. It's a. It's been a big topic. For those of you of those of you who are not familiar, click through rate is a metric comparing what's called an impression and a click. So an impression is that the amount of times an ad appears in Google search results, and a click is how many times people click on it. And so the ratio of clicks to impressions forms another metric called CTR or click through rate. CTR is generally a measure of how engaging your ad text is to your audience, and so. The policy that was referenced in the question is where Google now mandates a 5% CTR that you have to maintain. And people can sometimes struggle with that for sure. Now, the best I can, advice I can give you has to do with this slide. And that's why I mentioned this as being like a, a pretty big problem. If you put all your keywords in one ad group and you use one version of your ad text, it's not really possible to create like a perfect version that will be exactly relevant to every kind of idea or intent that is included in there. So the best advice I can say is split up your keywords and ad groups, and then you write ad text <clears throat> that is specific to those keywords. Also, the more that you can use the keyword itself within the ad text in a natural way, don't do it like forced, but in a natural way, that also helps increase the relevancy for CTR. So those items can help you. There's the tail end of the question that talks about automated versus manual. We are a big fan of the manual because it just allows you to control, have a lot more control over your messaging and what you say. And so I think that is usually always preferable. But then it comes down to a question of practicality, like how much time do you have? If you don't have as, uh, enough time, then maybe you have to defer to some more automated options. But I always think the manual is better because, yeah, you can be a lot more pointed with what you do. Great. We have a few questions about landing pages. So I'm just going to try and ask this in one question. Are there kinds of like restrictions around what the landing page can be? Could it be like Facebook or WordPress, a subdomain of their website or something like Canada Helps where they're getting their donations directed? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that we run into this issue quite often because it's people think that they can direct a Google ad to any web page. But in fact, ac according to the Google Grants policy, the web page that you choose must exist under your domain. Unfortunately, it cannot be a page that is on Canada Helps. It cannot be a page that's on Facebook or event. It has to be on your website. You can, however, create something called a landing page. So a landing page page is essentially a page that exists off of your website and you can make them on 30 third party plat platforms like Instapage. So it can, it, it, you can make a, a donation page or what have you. And essentially those, that third party platform will integrate with your domain and will be essentially a part of your website, but it's created on a third party platform. That's also easier to, to create new landing pages if you have to. And just to add to that, so when we say your domain, we also include subdomains and subfolders of that. And so Lily, Lily was talking about like a landing page builder, like Instapage, which can be hosted on subdomains. And that's why it's eligible. Now, you could also use other domains, but you need to submit another application to Google to get those other domains approved. So you could technically, you could possibly use a domain that's not the main one that you're approved for. There are some rules about that. <clears throat> it has to be a domain that you own. 
And that's why something like Facebook or Canon Helps is not eligible because you don't own that. Now, there are also just some a few small exceptions. There are three platforms that th they do allow people, nonprofits, to send ads directly to. It's Classy, Blackbot, and I forgot the other one. I think it's Artez. Uh, I can't remember the last one, but if you have a donation page hosted by one of those, you could send it directly there. And that's just one of the few exceptions. Okay. And then we have a couple of questions about the pricing or how the grant works, really. How much is a Google $1 of Google grants equal to $1 value of the ad? Or could you just speak briefly about how the payment and buying of the ads works? Oh, sure. Okay. So like we said, it's 10000 per month, but it's actually on a daily basis. So $329 per day. There is not really any kind of transaction that happens. What occurs in your account is it, it, whenever someone clicks on one of your ads, you get quote unquote charged a certain amount for that click. So let's say on average, your clicks are cost $1 per click. And let's say you do 100 clicks per day. Right? So you're technically getting $100 in spend per day. Of course, again, there's no transaction. It's just... Google just credits that in your, it's like using a credit inside your account. And then if you hit the max on 329 in the day, then it just stops for that day. So there was a question about like value, like how do you value like a $1 worth of ads to real life? And that's a, that's a difficult question because there, it really depends on what you do with that traffic. And there's also areas where it's more subjective. So let's say that you're using this $10,000 and you get a thousand more people onto this page about some kind of topic that you want to make people aware of, right? It's sometimes hard to value what awareness means to you. You could maybe think about some kind of estimated value of that, but other times it's like immeasurable. Now, imagine you're a nonprofit using the grant to sell something or to get donations or to promote an event and get tickets. Well, okay, so now you're getting to areas where you could potentially assign values, right? And so in order to, for you to fully understand that, you have to use Google Analytics or some kind of tracking method. And you want to track what happens down to the end of that transaction. And so if you have that system set up, then you can very clearly see what the advertising is doing for you. It's getting you a thousand more sales a month or 200 more registrants or 300 more emails. And then that's how you can value it. And it's so dependent on how you use it. Thanks. That was a super informative answer. And all the answers and presentation have been great. I think this is all the time that we have for today. And I want to thank you guys again for sharing your knowledge with us. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day to join us. If you have any further questions, you can contact me, Cindy at TechSoupCanada.ca, and there will be a survey at the end that will launch after the session in case you want Connect Ad to reach out to you or you have further questions. And a reminder that we'll be posting the webinar recording to our website within by the end of this week with the recording. Hello, everyone. There we go. Good. Thank you so much for being part of this event and, and watching the video with us. Again, if you have registered in the event, you're going to get a copy of the recording. If you weren't able to register for the event because you came from a direct link via a chat or something like that, or a WhatsApp group, you should still be able to register for the event right now if you just pop into this link. And, and otherwise, I'm now going to pass you back over to our host for the day. Thank you very much, Adelaide, for the uh, wonderful presentation and for bringing us this far. So at this point, we're going to take questions. I think we have some few questions here already. We're going to quickly take them and we'll be done. Yes, but before we take the questions, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Olaide, the co-founder and CEO of Amride. So please kindly come and tell us who you are and what you're about. Some of the questions that people are asking here, I think he's going to be able to throw some insight on them. So Mr. Olaide. Yeah, thank you very much for... Oh, no. um, sure. Hope you can hear me. 
Yeah, they're coming yes. through much better now. Yeah, thank you very much for this session and the, the insights about the what you what the presentation you bring to me. I think where people are having issues is that they don't understand that we actually listen to a pre-recorded um, session, but our the questions can be taken care of after. I think uh, what overall what I would say is that for a few of us that understand how universities are being run in Nigeria, they're actually leveraging on the Google Hats to have a workplace. That's why you have an ABC at the UI dot edu dot, and that can also be applicable in your foundation, religious organization, charity, not profit, library. Mention them, and as it were, this in, in this modern age, the not profit are actually being called social enterprise. The implication is that you must have a product or service to enhance the sustainability of your of your project, and as it were, people that want to work with you in terms of donation collaboration need you to be feasible. So for the Google, Google Hats will help you to leverage on the grant to create awareness about your projects and services. And this, of course, as each time you, you go on Google to ask stuff to search for any information, you will discover that you have the Google had to come up first, then we have we have organic that follows. And most of the time, in, in, in the context of this art information, people will appreciate to work with you because of your feasibility. And then you will be able to create that because leveraging on the search engine optimization to to push the actual text you want people to relate to it based on one or two information and the packaging that, that will help you. So this session, and if you, if you follow us from the beginning, we don't see that you do understand that an organization is based in U.S. that if you want to go and do postgraduate program, you just send your CV, you send your transcript to them. It's time you need your transcript. You don't need to come back to Nigeria as it were, or your school again. Just go back to the database you fetch your transcript and you can use it to work anywhere. Now, what that should him to do is to create, bridge the gap and ensure that you have access to quite a number of opportunities that from Microsoft, Google, Adobe, Cisco, mention them. And what it implies that because in your social enterprise and non-profit project, you have to relate, do a lot of programs, consume a lot of services, other from show or from mention them or from Microsoft. Now, the implication of this grant, now in the context of today's meeting, we are talking about Google Grants. But what TechSoup will help you to achieve is to create, profile you, and give you opportunity to access quite a number of uh, grants and partnership from local and international organizations as it were. So for us, of course, you've been told that you need a landing page. That's just as simple as a website that HTTPS verify. And uh, what it means is that a secure web, a secured website with HTTPS will actually help you to, it's part of the procedure that will enhance your EC approval fee for the grant and other stuff you want to do. After you listen to this, of course, we have a WhatsApp group. I'll drop the link in the group. But then, what we are looking at is that we will be willing to work with you in ensuring that the technology part of your projects, other product or service, your non profit, we actually move forward and do quite a stuff. Now, let me give us an example. For some that are into business and there's a social enterprise part of that, for instance, we do quite, quite, a lot of things with smallholder farmer. And these are farmers that lack access to, to markets and fund. Now, part of our social enterprise is to give them input to support their work. And if you give them input, who will look at it from perspective that, okay, I'm working with rural farmer, their income is low, the economy wide, the, 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 the standard of living is low. So support our work. If you sponsor, if you buy, for instance, for existing customer, if you buy three products, 
for every three products you buy, you will actually purchase one for us to give to farmer for free. So irrespective, other than offering service of product, not profits, grants stop grants like what Tech Soup has presented is actually good for you to create visibility about your work because in this age, the likes of Microsoft, Big Data, mention them, multinational organization. Before they can work with you, they want to see your feasibility, uh, digital footprint, and uh, how you are doing. So that with that, once you are feasible, fair, the, the Google has and the, quite a number of opportunities you are leveraging on, it will really help other partners to work with you and then you can scale whatever you are doing in terms of products or service. So I think that's what I have for now and then for everyone that registered for this event, we we'll get a recording and then we'll be available on the WhatsApp to support you, to provide clarity and so that you can quickly move on and get to work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Lide is the founder, the co-founder, CEO of Frozen Met Agro. He is also one of the partners and sponsors of this program. Looking at the questions, yes, the link will be available. I think most of the concerns are about the link, which has clearly been identified, uh, uh, addressed. Okay. One says, once we are approved, how do we apply the grant? I am approved. I run ad was still get built. Okay. That was from Gina. I think if you are being built, then it means you are not approved for the grant. Because if you are, then you shouldn't be uh, built for that. I think you need to check that again. Yeah. So the right uh, straight there, verification code happened. So you create your tech super account. And once that's been completely completed, then you'll actually log into that account. And there'll be a section in the account page showing you how to find the code. So it's not going to be in an email. It's instead going to be in a text soup message. I'll see if I can actually find that for you. Oh, yes. I think she just said something that clarifies. She said she was using the Google ad before. So it's, she probably is using her old account. When you create a text, you can actually use the same email, but Google ad gives you the non-profit ad comes with a different ID. So if you choose that one or you miss, you, you select the wrong account in there, which you could probably build you for that. Okay. Someone was asking also link us. Okay. Okay. That's what I was from Gina also. Yes. The guide will be available. I think the, I, I'm not understanding the second question. It talks about link us to the guide. There was something I shared in the chat, in the video, that was a step-by-step -step guide. And, but you'll be able to find all of that at the main Google nonprofit program. I go through their help pages. So that's where you'll find some information. But yes, Gia, you're totally right. Going through Google themselves is quite challenging. And so it's a bit of a difficulty there. And in fact, for the U.S., there is actually a new service available. Let me see if I can find the link for you. That is, that basically connects you with one of our trusted consultants to help you set up and manage your Google ad campaigns. Because we know it's, it's not friendly to everyone. It's, it's a high barrier tool. So let me see if I can find that. Yes, in the meantime, I think we have answered all the questions there. If there are other questions you want to ask, you can raise up your hand and also ask them. I say about to round up. Yeah, hello. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I, I think, well, Eli, let me say that the mm -hmm. of talking about this call is uh, for us to, after people have been exposed to the, the, the we, we, this is an information session. After this session, Anybody that needs further support and clarity will be available to do that. That's why we have a WhatsApp group for Nigeria and Sierra Leone to, to work with people so that once next week stuff is being sorted out, then we'll bring them to text to, to move the work forward. So do get that now. So we'll be available after this call, share the WhatsApp group to, for people to have a clarity and response to any of the questions that is not clear, after they watch the uh, um, information session, then we could hand through them to work with them and see uh, how they move forward and get the ready and uh, 
uh, we connect them to the tech suite so that every other thing can be sorted and they have access to the, to the, uh, what's it called? Have access to the clients. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the, using the, the LinkedIn group is a valuable resource and you'll see the link in the chat to help connect you with getting some additional support. And otherwise it may well make sense for us to host a second event where we can actually go in to a live account and do help people in real time. So that may be a follow-up event that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. We are saying the same thing. After the information session, we'll be able to people that actually need the service that are willing. Because on the group, we have over 100 people. But because of the rain and network, quite a number of people are unable to join the call. So we do hope that for everyone that registered for the event, we'll be able to have access to the information session. They will go through it. Then we'll come back to the group. And in the next one, we'll look at question and answer and get uh, clarity. So once people get clarity about the uh, Google had Google had grants. Then we now schedule another session where we do a live demo. From live demo, then we can now talk about moving on from there. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Perfect. that's correct. I have I have an account in soon. Hopefully, the next meeting we will to do the live demo. I couldn't do that today due to some. And like, do you have something else to say? More to say before we round up. No, I think I've covered everything today. Just as a final reminder is I will take this recording and share it with everyone who registered. Thank you very much. From my end, Sue, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Olaide, for your support. Mr. Olaide is our son and, and he is also a technical expert in the areas of the web design and organization has a need or needs support in those areas to be able to work you through. And that's why he's here and available to support. For today, thank you very much. I am Hilenen Aben. I am the host for Texas Sierra Leone. This is our first event. I'm glad that you came to attend the meeting. This is the first time we're having this in Sierra Leone. And I'm really proud that our first session is this awesome. We're looking forward to much more successful meetings like this.